this new seminar of the Central Asia program at George Washington University. Welcome everybody. My name is Marlene Laurel. I'm the director of the program. My pleasure to have you here with us today to discuss what, what is at stake in Tajikistan's presidential election that will be happening this weekend in a very uh, uh, ethic, hectic um, atmosphere globally in the post-Soviet space with uh, a lot of uh, uh, unrest and riots and uh, uh, revolutions not far away in Kyrgyzstan and a kind of peaceful protest in, in uh, Belarus. And I even don't speak about what is happening in is once again in the spotlight for several uh, uh, aspects. But here today we'll be discussing what is happening in Tajikistan and we have a really good uh, panel combining a lot of different perspectives and I will be presenting now our three speakers. We will first give the floor to Sirojidin Tolibov who is the managing editor at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty Tajik Service. He is based in Prague now. Then we will have Ellen Thibault, Professor of Political Science at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. And then Dr. Arnold Lehman, Research School of Government and Public Services, Texas University, based in Washington, D.C. So I will give you the floor for about 10 minutes each. And then uh, after, we will have about half an hour for the discussion. I ask uh, people in the audience to ask their question in the chat or the Q&A section and I will moderate the discussion and try to bring all the questions together and, and, and generate the discussion. So let's begin, Sirojidin, I give you the floor to tell us a little bit what is happening in, in, in this election and how is the situation currently in Tajikistan. Thank you very much. Uh, almost 28 years ago on November 17, on the day when my father uh, was taken to hospital, in the north of Tajikistan, I had to take a vacation from my university in Tashkent and to dash to a hospital to see my father. Uh, I was a third year student uh, at the Tashkent State Institute of Oriental Studies. And I still remember that day because when I arrived in the central terminal, bus terminal, it was announced on old Soviet type loudspeaker that uh, a new head of Tajikistan was appointed in a special session in Khojand in the northern Tajikistan. What a strange name, I thought, because they said Imam Ali Rahmanov, both Imam, who leads a prayer, and Rahmanov, you know, also is attributed to the God. So a few days from now, uh, uh, from the same place in my town where I grown up, uh, this time from the Chinese loudspeaker, they will announce Imam Ali Rahman as the president of Tajikistan for the fifth consecutive times. Uh, as if nothing has changed here in my country. Only I have matured for 28 years and my two sons graduated from the university. Both my sons know only one politician in Tajikistan, like other uh, their peers, uh, Imam Ali Rahman. Uh, so in Tajikistan, we have one politician, one person who decides the fate of the country. When Arafarel's Tajik Service has recently um, uh, interviewed, did a vox pop in the streets of Dushanbe about the candidates, no one knew even one single uh, name of one of those uh, remaining four candidates for presidency. Just uh, the name of Imam Rahman. One of them who we interviewed mentioned his son's name as his rival. So ironically, it might be true as well. Uh, Rahman will be announced as a president of Tajikistan in a very uh, you know, difficult year for Tajikistan economically um, and uh, uh, political turmoil which is going on in Kyrgyzstan may affect the internal situation in the country as well. But overall, for people in Tajikistan, the prices of potato or meat is much more interesting than presidential election. People are so desperate uh, uh, because winter is coming and uh, many people, many migrants who are in Russia or Kazakhstan cannot send remittances uh, to their homes, cannot feed their families, and those who are in Tajikistan cannot go back to Russia. 
uh, this deadlock uh, and this situation might affect economically uh, for people in Tajikistan. Um, uh, it is uh, the the political elite or political atmosphere is not interested. Uh, they are not interested at all for them. Uh, uh, feeding their families and uh, just to survive this winter is much more important than uh, the election which will take place on Sunday. Everybody knows that it is a political farce. Everybody knows that Rahman will be appointed, but no one knows how many persons will get. Uh, will get. Will he get? Um, I think only Rahman knows. Uh, I think uh, between eighty and ninety percent will be. Uh, you know uh, the percentage that he will get from the elections. Uh, for many of those who are interested in political situation, analyzing the internal rivalry in the country. Uh, the important, uh, the importance of this election is uh, what's going to happen next. Because uh, we expect, uh, in my opinion, there will be a reshuffle in the government. Each time when Rahman is appointed, he um, uh, appoints new people, uh, new faces in the government. Uh, when he was appointed for the first time, in 1992, uh, uh, all those who surrounded him now either retired, some of them uh, were killed, uh, some of them, even his close allies, have been imprisoned, some of them died in prisons, some of them just, uh, just uh, were released, were just released from prison, some of them are just waiting uh, for their time. Some of them have been spending their years in the prison. So this is the political reality in Tajikistan. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the second person in power, uh, his son, uh, will uh, eventually come to power. We don't know when. Uh, it will depend on political situation and on the health of Imam Ali Rahman himself. I think he will let his son, uh, the senator, the, the, the chairman of upper um, um, parliament, uh, to upper chamber of the parliament, uh, uh, to, to bring to power those who are loyal to him. Uh, I think uh, the government will be renewed, uh, fresh blood will come to uh, to uh, new various ministries, uh, but everything will depend on the key ministries, of course, Interior Ministry, Minister of Defense, and uh, and National Security Service. So these are the three key ministries, uh, and the ministers have not been replaced for a while. Mm. Apart from that, uh, we should not expect anything. There will be no revolution in uh, Tajikistan. Tajikistan is not uh, Kyrgyzstan because uh, Rahman uh, rules the country with very strong power. And uh, he, when he came to power, he himself said that he had only one um, uh, uh, so uh, smart uh, clue. Today, uh, he's a multi-billionaire. His family uh, rule the country and we should not expect anything. So, and um, everything is under the control from the north to the east, from the center to uh, Pamir Mountains, uh, will follow his orders. Uh, and uh, those who are very loyal to him uh, will benefit from it. So this is why not, not uh, uh, we should expect reshuffle after the elections. Soon after, I think, by spring, we'll see the changes, but not now. Uh, so this is all I want to, to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, perspective. I now would like to give the floor. Oh, we have some feedback. Sorry, I now would like to give the floor to Helen. Uh, yes, thank you for the invitation. Um, the contribution I wanted to make was to uh, put things in perspective. 
so the question of the panel, uh, the, 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 the title of the panel is what's, what is at, at stake here? Um, and it's basically a lot of people are wondering, um, or yeah, do not even bother with some of the candidates, yeah, because it's sort of clear what will be the outcome of this election. But it's aftermath of the election that really matters. Um, and everyone is wondering, um, when is the succession of power going to take place? When is it going to happen? Uh, and that's the main, that's the key issue of this, of this election. And even some, um, uh, some people were thinking that uh, even Imam Ali Rahman himself would not even run for that election, that his son would, uh, since they changed the constitution uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, to reduce uh, the age of, uh, the minimum age for people, for, for, for candidates to run for a presidential election in Kazakhstan, so that people were, th were thinking, uh, Rustam Imam Ali is going to run. Uh, but that didn't happen. But that doesn't mean that um, Imam Ali Rahman will finish his presidential term. Uh, presidential terms are quite long in Tajikistan, seven years. Uh, so he's unlikely to go until the end. Um, and I think uh, what we'll see is probably a scenario like we saw in Kazakhstan, uh, where uh, the president actually stepped down. Um, and it's a transition that went relatively smoothly, we could say. Uh, people also expected uh, Dariga, this, the this daughter of uh, President Nazarbayev, uh, Dariga Nazarbayev, had to run uh, for that election. Uh, she was the Speaker of the Senate, uh, so she was second in line, uh, such as uh, is Imam Ali, um, Rustam Imam Ali right now. Uh, he's second in line, in the line of power. But she was sidelined, so a lot of people were a bit surprised about that. Um, and that says something probably about the cohesion of the elites. And I think when we, from a political science perspective, when we look at um, uh, political succession in authoritarian regimes, there are, we could say, three factors that really matter. Uh, first of all is the cohesion, the degree of cohesion of the elites. Um, and what we see in, in, what we saw in Kazakhstan, I think there's a lot more competition uh, between different clans or different uh, business uh, group, uh, business groups that have um, different interests. Um, but I think in Tajikistan, um, we see a lot more cohesion in terms of the elites uh, themselves. Um, Tajikistan is a smaller country uh, than Kazakhstan, if we put things in, compar in comparison. It's smaller. Um, and I think even we should not dismiss the fact that the president uh, has a very large family. He has nine children. So that's nine more spouses. So it's already a lot of people within the family. So there's a, I mean, and they appear from my perspective, as far as I know, they appear fairly cohesive, fairly united in this. And, and then there are even dozens of uh, grandchildren. Some of our, are already of, of adult age. Um, so there seems to be a lot of cohesion, even as um, uh, Siro uh, Jidin mentioned, there, there is cohesion within the country, surprisingly, for a country that has uh, known, that has been through a, a civil war, it uh, has been uh, united forcibly uh, under uh, authoritarianism, um, quite successfully, if I can use this word. Um, um, it, but perhaps Gono uh, Badakshan, Gbao, um, Badakhshan Autonomous uh, Region in the South uh, is always a point of contention, uh, is a, is like a weakness, weakness, weakness uh, point. And there was actually one candidate, a uh, truly independent one, uh, for probably, uh, we don't know much about him, but Irgashev, I think is his name, uh, he, was, uh, he wanted to register. Um, but he was uh, prevented to. But it's very, it's very hard for political, independent political actors to emerge. Uh, for different political reasons, of course, uh, strong pressure, authoritarian pressure, uh, but also uh, because even the laws are very complicated. You need to gather 5% of all, 5% uh, 5 of all electors, sing of, of all electors of, uh, of uh, Tajikistan. So that's really a lot of people. That's, um, that's around 210,000 uh, people. So that's, that's very difficult for once. Um, so yeah, so we have this cohesion, um, like I said, uh, and also I think even if the South, where Imam Ali Ahmad is from, uh, we see um, some, uh, the, South, the Southern politicians are probably overrepresented in, in the positions of power. Uh, but at the same time, you see some new alliances, like uh, recent, I think last year, 
um, Rahman's granddaughter married the grandson of the Akim, the governor of uh, the Subd region in the north. So this is something quite interesting because we see um, uh, we see some kind of alliances formed through marriage. It's it seems it sounds very monarchical in a way, uh, but if uh, Rustam Mamali actually becomes the president, uh, then we will see um, uh, yeah, a quasi monarchy uh, taking place uh, in, the, in in Tajikistan. Um, and I think we can make comparisons with Kyrgyzstan, where it's, it's such a different, uh, an entirely different scenario. Um, like uh, Sirojidin has already mentioned, it's very unlikely that we will see that in Tajikistan, um, because I think Kyrgyzstan is very special. I mean, it's not their first uh, so-called government overthrow. Um, it's already the third that we see. And uh, I think elites, uh, elites in, in Kyrgyzstan have proven to be a lot more dynamic and, and uh, there's a lot more competition going on there. Uh, civil society is also very active, as we know. Um, and then we have also um, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan like this experience already, yeah, that uh, we have been um, successful before and then we can do it again. So the, the Kyrgyz scenario is very different because of that. Um, more competition uh, and also more open open media, and that's one of the problems um, in in Tajikistan. I'm sure everybody uh, uh, already knows that uh, media is very controlled. Uh, a lot of people don't have access to independent news, um, so and it's a, a lot of praise uh, for for the president and his role in ending the war. Uh, again, today I was watching Facebook on some uh, social networks, some some groups. Uh, they were posting a lot of videos posted about uh, how Rahman uh, was uh, so instrumental in ending the civil war and establishing peace. That's his official title according to the constitution. Um, so yeah, so I think we are unlikely to see uh, a radical successive change, um, uh, succession change um, in Uzbekistan. Things went uh, not so smoothly, we could say. Um, there was a lot of uh, reshuffling uh, after uh, Karimov died, but he also died in office, right? And he was also um, not successful in uh, saving uh, his own family. Um, but, uh, and again, I think Uzbekistan is a different case because competition between elites is a lot more, it's uh, more fierce uh, and there are bigger, uh, bigger groups that have uh, stronger competition between themselves. Um, and I don't think we see that. Uh, in uh, in uh, in Tajikistan, there are very few politicians who stand out. Uh, actually, there might be the prime minister, who is actually uh, from the Sud region, uh, Rasul Zada. Um, so he could be a potential challenger, but I don't think people would even see him as a challenger. Uh, uh, yeah, the, I think the what we uh, should uh, get from it is that elite is fairly stable and united against the president and his family. I will stop here um, and uh, we'll be uh, uh, delighted to answer questions later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank would you. like now to give the floor to Edward. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, so building off what the other two speakers have said, i um, just like to sort of take a look back into history, into the history of Tajik elections, and then look forward to some of the challenges that are going to be facing um, the new president, which, as we all expect, will be Elamali Rahman. So I think if we look back at the four previous elections, you know, what we've seen, as we've seen across the country over its sort of independent history, especially since Rahman came to power as head of state in 1992, is obviously this slow consolidation of power that Sirojdin mentioned uh, in his remarks. And so when we saw the first presidential election in 1994, that was probably the most competitive of uh, Tajikistan's independent history, where there was a genuine opposition uh, candidate, or at least rival candidate with national status, Abdullah John uh, from the north of the country, facing off against Rahman, who only won 70% of the vote that time around. The second election, um, in 1999, saw Rahman face off against Davlat Usman. And even though Rahman won 97% of the vote, I think we can say that it was more competitive insofar as at least the Islamic Renaissance Party and the opposition were allowed to field uh, or able to field a candidate in that contest who would offer a genuine, genuinely different vision to the current president. And since then, in the 
uh, three previous, uh, two previous elections, we've seen the model that we're seeing in 2020, which is these uh, candidates, as we've already mentioned, who are from faux opposition parties who don't really have a public um, uh, profile, who don't have uh, well-known or well-articulated policies, and who ultimately, you know, don't form a real opposition. And that's the sort of that's what we're seeing now. Is it's sort of an election that is um, effectively for show, and the only real question is, as Sadojdi mentioned, uh, you know, what percentage of the vote will Rahman get? Will it be 85 percent? Will it be 83 percent? Remains to be seen uh, this weekend. So, what are some of the the challenges that Rahman will face going forward? Um, well, obviously, the major challenge is COVID nineteen. So I'm just going to dwell a little bit on COVID-19 and how that's affecting the country um, before talking a little bit about sort of uh, elite stability and uh, the way in which, you know, Rachman, as he moves towards a transition, will need to carefully manage um, sort of different interest groups within his, uh, within his family in particular that have come to control large parts of the Tajik economy and obviously have come to dominate the political system. Um, so obviously, as we know, COVID-19 has had a, um, a negative effect on countries around the world, and Tajikistan has certainly not been immune to that, you know, even though it hasn't had a mass lockdown in the way that we've seen in uh, certainly in three of the other Central Asian states, um, starting from March. So obviously, as we know, it recognized its first case quite late, with a lot of speculation, uh, suspicious deaths in April, and it, didn't, it waited till the end of April, which was six weeks after um, neighboring Central Asian states had declared their first case is to officially declare its first case. Um, we've obviously seen the healthcare system tested, a uh, lack of PPE, um, but ultimately the healthcare system hasn't collapsed. We've seen the government reporting now 10,000 cases and 68 deaths, um, but obviously crowdsourced um, uh, efforts by Radio Free Europe um, and uh, by other sort of uh, civil society organizations have obviously put the death toll much higher than the official 68 figure. So there's a sort of, you know, as in other Central Asian states, there's a sort of lack of uh, uh, credibility in the government's narrative on the way in which it's controlling the virus. But probably more importantly is the effect it's having on migration, which was always cited as a sort of major factor in the stability of the country. The fact that the country could export um, something like uh, a third of its labor force um, to Russia primarily each year um, and bring back remittances sent back, which at one time in the sort of you know, seven, seven years ago made up half of the uh, economy, effectively half of the illicit economy and um, in more recent years made up one third of the economy. Obviously, what we've seen since Russia's closed its borders and went into lockdown itself is a decline in remittances. And so across Central Asia, um, we've seen a 22% decline between the first half of 2019, which is probably the best benchmark to compare in the first half of 2020. But in Tajikistan, we've seen a 38% decline. This is according to the Russian Central Bank statistics. So maybe it doesn't capture all of the different money being sent back in different ways. But it gives us an indication that, you know, Tajikistan of the countries in Central Asia um, has been the worst affected by this drop uh, in remittances. Um, so we've seen a 38% uh, decline in Tajikistan's remittances. Um, what we have from sort of survey data um, that that uh, I conducted last year with Noah Tucker is evidence that remittance dependence was increasing uh, in Tajikistan in recent years rather than decreasing. And World Bank surveys indicate that 80% of remittances are spent on basic necessities. And so what we've seen uh, since the decline in remittances is you know, 57%, according to World Bank's listening to Tajikistan survey, 57% decrease um, in household uh, food consumption. You know, we're seeing an increasing report of uh, people uh, within households, a doubling of the number of people within households reporting that some no one there worked in the past um, seven days, past week, um, and an increase, or sort of, sorry, an increase in those reporting a deterioration in, in uh, finances as well, a uh, tripling of that. Um, from 8% to 23%. I mean, this is going to have a sort of a serious effect on the economy, uh, on liquidity in the banking sector, for example, um, on uh, people's ability to uh, uh, have a livelihood on the poverty level, on the unemployment level. And unfortunately, even though the government 
perpetually in its uh, in its speeches, but in the president's speeches, sort of tells us about all the great sort of progress they're making in terms of creating um, industrial and other uh, sort of service industries within the country. You know, there's the, the there's, there's no uh, capacity to absorb the uh, excess labor that's now back in the country. Um, and, you know, there's no way of sort of, uh, there's no real strategy um, for dealing with, with this economic shock. And so that's going to be something to sort of, uh, for the new uh, administration, um, if we're expecting a sort of rotation of the cadres, as Sir Rajdeen mentioned, it's going to be a major priority for them to deal with. And obviously it's something that's cut into, um, you know, Rahman's family itself, you know, businesses like Faroz and holding company, controlled by Shams al Sahibov and the Sahibov family, married into the president's family. You know, it's, it's something that's that, that that's going to affect their um, their income as well, given that they're invested in sectors, including construction. And so I think a second, you know, challenge, especially as uh, sort of linked to COVID is sort of managing external dependence. Um, obviously, as we know, uh, Russia, um, Tajikistan remains dependent on Russia through migration. Uh, Russia obviously stations uh, largest one of its largest military facilities outside of Russia within Tajikistan, and so supplied you know, the majority of the arms to the country since independence. So it remains dependent on Russia, but also obviously increasingly um, dependent on China, which controls just under half of foreign debt and is obviously the leading trade and investor in the country. And so, you know, as um, it continues to struggle to deal with COVID and increasingly relies on external credit um, to sort of build up, you know, sort of to, to make up for those uh, decreased tax revenues, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, we'll see it needing to manage this relationship with China more carefully. Um, interestingly, in the news today, we saw that Tajikistan didn't sign on to uh, the letter approving uh, of China's dealing with the uh, approach to the, the uh, the situation in Xinjiang, the letter that China submitted to the UN uh, with various signatories approving of its policy towards the uh, ethnic Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other groups that are in detention camps there. Tajikistan signed on last year, but didn't sign on this year. So that's an interesting sign of sort of maybe some degree of, of pushback against China, but it's going to be obviously a, a, a difficult relationship to manage. And just briefly to finish on, um, I think the other issue will be sort of intra in the stability. Um, you know, I think. Um, Rahman has been a master of uh, managing and manipulating um, the elite within the country. And so as you know, he transitions in power, I think his priority, as has already been mentioned, will be maintaining power within, within the family in particular. But there are obviously those within the family who potentially will struggle with each other for different economic assets, you know, let's say. Uh, Rustam, on the one hand, uh, Ozoda, his sister, and her husband, Jamaluddin Muraliyev, on the other hand, the Sohibobs, uh, the Asadullah Ozodas, who also married into the family uh, through uh, Rahman's wife. You know, these are all part of the same family, and with this sort of pyramidal system with Rahman at the top, they're, you know, they're kept in check for the most part. But when Rahman departs or starts to depart, you know, I think this will be interesting to see um, you know, whether struggles develop between those individuals um, and those different sort of uh, interest groups. So that'll be certainly something uh, to watch as we go forward. But with that, at the half an hour mark, I guess I'll finish so we can have a good portion for Q&A. Thank you so much, Ed, for your presentation. I invite people who have questions and comments to send them in the chat box. There are already several of them, so I will be moderating the discussion now. Uh, a first round of question about action uh, uh, itself and the reaction of the Tajikity. So, a question open to the of you. Uh, why is the Tajik government bothering with showing an election where we know that the result is is uh, uh, obvious? So, what is the the, the, the political performance that is at stake when a government like the Tajik one has to kind of play act democracy. So that's the first kind of question about the, the political performance of an election in an authoritarian regime. 
And the second one related to that about the existence and the actions of civil society and whoever can have some room of autonomy. What do we see about this Tajik civil society trying to react to the current situation? And do they try to be acting on, on uh, to be visible on some not purely political level, of course, but maybe mostly kind of freedom of uh, freedom of press or, or commenting on social media or kind of being visible at the local level. So two questions, one on the the, the symbolism of an, uh, make, uh, having an election and then on the, the civil society. Who would like to begin to answer? Ed, would you like to begin? Sure. Uh, well, I think they have to have an election because they're legally sort of required to do so, at least under the current laws and constitution. Um, you know, they still claim in their I think the first article of their constitution to be a democratic state. And obviously to be a democratic state requires at least holding elections, no matter how um, free and fair those are. So I think, you know, I think, you know, there are there is this sort of symbolic element to which, you know, even though no one believes that the election is real, it needs to take place you know, just to have some semblance of reality in the discourse that the government is offering. Um, so I think that's sort of one of the reasons um, that, you know, there's still regular presidential elections, even though Rahman is also leader of the nation and has been uh, since, I guess, 2015. Um, and then the constitutional change, changes came the next year. So it's sort of, you know, I think even despite he has that status, he still wants to reaffirm his popular um, that sort of sovereignty on an, any regular basis. I think in terms of civil society, I can hand over to my other colleagues, but just briefly, you know, I think there are certain, you know, avenues of, and there are certain individuals and groups who are active, not in sort of pushing back so much against sort of things like the presidential election, but certainly, you know, working in the spheres of human rights, like said, press freedom. And, you know, these aren't necessarily all um, members of formal civil society. You know, I think something that COVID has strengthened, and this was a trend that existed before um, before the uh, before the pandemic you know is this sort of forms of civil civil activism and and sort of uh, you know uh, you know forms of civil society that aren't necessarily organized you know they're often organized through social media and so during the pandemic we've obviously seen various efforts by the diaspora and migrant communities for example and communities within Tajikistan to you know provide relief to individuals where the state wasn't capable of doing that you know, and there are a number of artists and activists and people using younger generation using Instagram. And there's an interesting piece uh, in the Calvert Journal on this I think last week or the week before. Uh, you know, and, and so there are these forms of sort of activism that are, are, are taking place. They're not necessarily sort of openly opposing the national government, but they're certainly expressing you know free um, forms of different forms of free freedom of expression. I think that's that's something that'll be interesting to uh, to watch going going forward. Thanks. Hélène, would you like to, to add something? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, yes. I, I agree with, uh, with Edward uh, in the, um, uh, well, yeah, they have to organize elections. Uh, and there are actually very few countries in the world that, uh, however authoritarian they may be, to, to, to a great extent, they will still organize uh, elections, right? So it's a, symbolic uh, legitimacy that they have to do, uh, even if it's a mascarade, you could say. Um, but um, in terms of civil society, uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday I was uh, watching a, uh, an interview with a famous uh, journalist who spent time in prison, Khairuru uh, Mirsaidov, and he said something very interesting. So there is, as we said, little uh, civil society mobilization uh, in Tajikistan. But he said one way that people could uh, sort of voice the discontent with this election is by not going to vote. Um, so, um, so that would that would be an indicator to the to the government that uh, if people don't show up, basically in the at the day of the elections, they stay home for probably because they are yeah they don't really see the point of this election. They already know who's going to win. Uh, maybe for health reasons because of COVID uh, this year. Um, but uh, but yeah, so this. This could be one way that people could protest that is not very risky, uh, but also sends a message. Uh, so I found this idea interesting, but at the same time, we know in the post-Soviet world, a lot of uh, institutions are mobilized uh, to bring people to vote. Yeah, people call each other the Mahala, 
um, uh, director will call people. The, the the school teacher, the the school director will bring the the the, the students and uh, uh, or uh, or the professors and and try to engage them. Uh, but yeah, so that that could be one way that people could mobilize. Um, in my opinion, uh, Tajikistan, yes. like, uh, like a few countries in the world, across the world, is dependent on donor countries, uh, international organizations who help a lot. Uh, Tajikistan uh, just to survive, you know, uh, and um, because of the security reasons uh, to strengthen the border, uh, the United States, the Western countries uh, pay millions every year. Uh, uh, so Tajikistan has a military base. Uh, remittances, of course, uh, are the vital uh, point here. But uh, overall, Tajikistan is donor-dependent country, and they have to follow the rules. Uh, although uh, everybody knows that even without elections, uh, Rahman will say power, but Rahman has yet to reach the level of Saudi Arabia or Qatar where you don't need to hold any elections uh, for president. So, uh, and um, everything is possible in current situation. And um, although although Rahman is officially president, but he, have, he has all attributes of a uh, king. Uh, he is a leader of the nation. He's estimated uh, leader of the nation. He is uh, the founder of peace and stability. You must use these words before you pr uh, pronounce his name. It is by law you're required to use this name. Like, you know, it, it was in Turkmenistan, uh, Turkmen uh, in Turkmen, uh, or current president, incumbent president is uh, Al-Qaeda. He is also a steamed leader. So, uh, by law, he is protected by law, and he is allowed to rule the country while he's alive. Uh, even he, if he quits uh, the post of president, he will stay the, as the leader of the nation, which is above the president. Uh, so after two or three years, when uh, uh, his son is mature enough, uh, let's say when he is 35, uh, Rahman may decide, you know, to, to give some uh, power to his son to make him a president and uh, and to, uh, to stay behind the scenes as the leader of the nation and to allow his son to become more stronger until he completely retires. So this is the rules. But you know the the threat to Rahman's rule comes not from outside of his column. Uh, or migrants, I think threat to Rahman comes from his own circle, because we have a group of billionaires, not millionaires, a group of billionaires in Tajikistan, uh, which uh, holds uh, almost half of the country's economy, starting from his son. He has, as you mentioned, Ellen, um, uh, nine children, seven daughters and two sons. So, and their children also growing up. So. Uh, uh, overall, if you look at in-laws, uh, relatives, the whole tribe, we, we, we are talking about several thousand people. And all of them are millionaires, multimillionaires, and billionaires. There was a competition in the 1990s, who will become the first millionaire in that family? That was uh, when they gather, they used to joke with each other. Now they joke, who can become a multimillionaire? So, uh, and um, obviously, when Rahman is gone, there will be struggle for power, and I think this will be among the members of the family. Uh, thank you. So, 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 thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we can connect all the questions. Yes. Um, there are several questions, of course, in the parallel with what is happening in Kyrgyzstan, asking us how the Tajik elites are looking at what is happening in Tajikistan. <laughs> Do we see the government tightening control or expressing clear concern that you could have people going in the street in Tajikistan also? So will that be the opening the room for more repression or whatever? I mean, what is the, the, the Tajik perception of what is happening in Kyrgyzstan and any kind of spillover from Tajikistan, either in terms of people going in the street or of uh, repression coming from the side of the government to prevent that? Um, who would like to 
uh, responding. I can jump in as, as the first if you allow me. Yes, um, uh, yes. Uh, 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 from the surface, if you, if you look at the from the surface, as if nothing has changed, uh, life is normal. Although turmoil is going on in neighboring country, but we know for sure that yes, government is concerned. And now say is a Kazarma regime, as we call it, and and power ministry carefully with uh, cautiously uh, looking and monitoring the situation in neighboring country. Even slightest uh, threat is uh, is seen as very major threat in authoritarian countries. Although we don't see the, from the surface uh, that Rahman is concerned, but. We, we know uh, from our sources within the government that yes, they're concerned and they, they're threat, uh, they're, uh, yeah, because the major uh, political event is approaching and uh, timing is very bad, but uh, they will try to do it smoothly. Uh, it's a good thing for Rahman's government is that uh, now is a, because of the COVID outbreak, the border with Kyrgyzstan is closed uh, since mid of March. And uh, and uh, experts say that uh, they expect changes in Kyrgyzstan, but uh, not major changes in Tajikistan. Thank you. Helen, would you like to comment? On um, yeah, actually, um, I, I tried to talk to someone uh, in preparation for this talk, so I called a few a few people in in Tajikistan, and um, um, it was yesterday, the last time I spoke to this person, and. Who is usually very well aware of what's going on, and she, this person had had no idea uh, what I, I I I told her what happened in Kyrgyzstan in the beginning of the week. So um, she has limited aspect, uh, access to the internet. But I think if you are not well connected uh, and don't have access to alternative sources uh, of news, um, people in 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 Tajikistan do not know. I mean, a lot of people have internet access, of course. Uh, but there are a lot of people who don't. So that, I mean, that's just one example of how difficult. Uh, I think the spillover is unlikely to happen, uh, maybe because of that. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, the civil society is very different, extremely mobilized in Tajikistan. Uh, has been for a long time since the beginning of independence. Whereas in in Tajikistan, you had the civil war. There was no time to organize any some kind of civil society. And then the the the, the strengthening of, of authoritarian uh, rule over the years. And a lot of NGOs have closed down, uh, so the, the, it's very different civil society situation. Plus, comp uh, very difficult access to uh, free uh, to uh, independent information. Ed, would you like? To, Ed, would you like to add? Sure, just very briefly. Um, yeah, I think as as Helene said, you know, the Kyrgyz elections are. 16 different political parties competing, obviously the most competitive elections uh, within Central Asia. Um, and you know what we've seen in that country as an attempt by the incumbent sort of president to um, you know, effectively um, steal a majority within within parliament or at least you know, rig the elections to favor pro pro um, pro uh, presidential parties. And you know, we've seen, as Elaine said, stronger civil society and also, you know, various sort of different interest interest groups and individuals who are, you know, trying to sort of capitalize on this situation for effectively for, 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 a, for a power grab. Um, and, you know, I don't think we have that same degree of, of, of sort of non-cohesion within um, and different interest groups within Tajikistan for such a scenario. Can the government overreact? Um, you know, yes, I think we've seen in, in the past, you know, for example, when Group 24 exiled opposition group um, called for protests, I think back in 2014, you know, we saw the riot police being deployed, you know, firing a water cannon at fake protesters. Uh, we've met at that time, I think we saw many social media and other websites blocked uh, and the organization being declared an extremist group. So I think, um, as Sir Dean said, you know, the uh, security services and the Minister of Internal Affairs will certainly be on high alert. Um, will we see protests as a result of the election? I don't think so, because the election sort of isn't contested effectively in the way that Kyrgyzstan was. But can we see protests afterwards going forward? Yes, I think it's possible that we'll see small uh, protests, you know, as, as sort of as part of uh, Oxford Society for Central Asian Affairs. We, uh, non-profit uh, that I'm involved with, um, you know, we've been tracking protests in the region 
and Tajikistan hasn't had too many protests, and some of those protests have been actually pro-governmental targeting the opposition. But we have seen sort of protests, um, for example, in the aftermath of a, a flood, natural disaster in the south of the country early this year, um, and particularly in uh, in the Pamir region, which has sort of always had this sort of more um, a difficult relationship, shall we say, with the central government. So I think it's possible that you know we will see small scale protests uh, going forward related to uh, potentially related to food, potentially related to COVID, uh, related to uh, repression by uh, the government, uh, particularly by police and security services arresting individuals. Um, but I don't think we're going to see sort of mass protests in the way that we've seen in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. We have a third round of questions that are more geopolitical about the relationship with China. Do we think that the, the Tajik government will be increasing the cooperation with China, both economically and in the military sector? We also had a question about the Russia in looking for stability in Tajikistan and what does that mean? Do we see any sign in Russia? that they would like to go for someone else than uh, the current president or for the son of the president? Or are they, on the contrary, very you know, agnostic and happy to keep things as they are going? And also linked to that, a question about uh, Tajik migrants in Russia. Do we have any information about their, their voting? I mean, I'm not sure the real question is about the voting, but let's say with their political orientation and any kind of a, a way of the, the Tajik migrants in Russia to organize themselves politically and try to, to, to create some kind of political action as we had several years ago. Um, who would like to begin with this geopolitical uh, uh, perspective? Hélène? Uh, sure. Um, I Probably not the most competent to, to answer that, uh, but uh, yeah, indeed Russia is a, a very important player. Um, and um, uh, I think Putin has been very supportive of Imam Ali Rahman in the last uh, three decades, <laughs> three decades. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think uh, probably um, they wouldn't oppose uh, the decision to 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 to, to put uh, Rustem Imam Ali in in the position of president. Uh, probably, uh, I think uh, Russia is not that picky. <laughs> as long as uh, they can guarantee that this uh, new leader will uh, will uh, pursue good relations with Russia. Um, one thing that is interesting is that um, Tajikistan, though, has refused to join the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, so that, that's something interesting that uh, because uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan have joined, uh, Tajikistan was asked to, uh, but refused. Uh, so it might be a point of contention. I think the military base uh, that uh, Russia has in Tajikistan, which is the largest outside Russia, is secure. Uh, so that shouldn't be an issue, I think. Um, and, um, and maybe the renegotiation of the, the lease could be a point of contention. But I think uh, relations are very good in general. And indeed, they, they're codependent because now even Russian businessmen uh, and businesswomen are complaining that uh, they don't have enough uh, workers. Yeah, so they would like to welcome. Uh, so Russian economy, it's a codependency. I mean, of course, Tajikistan is in a weaker position, uh, but the, the, the exchange of workers is, is very important for the two of them. Um, but um, as for China, um, there were rumors um, that uh, China would uh, build a, a military base uh, in, Kyrgyz, uh, in Tajikistan. Uh, they might have uh, funded one uh, re la uh, maybe two years ago. Uh, but um, so, yeah, the, the relations are strengthening, of course, between Russia, uh, between China and Tajikistan. But I don't know to what extent it mean that Russia will be sidelined. Okay, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Ed, would you like to add something on the relationship to China? Sure. So I think it's, it, it's growing. Um, and as I said in my comments, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see in the ways in which, you know, post COVID, um, you know, how dependency on China increases. You know, I think we've seen China emerge as, um, as, as sort of a major security partner for Tajikistan, um, building its first overseas base in the region. Uh, People's Armed Police opened in, looks like in 2016, first sort of became public knowledge last year. 
Um, we've seen them rebuild various barracks and border posts. We've seen joint border patrols. You know, so I think China's really ramped up its efforts and it's increasingly going bilater bilaterally or multilaterally without Russia. It set up its own sort of C5 plus one foreign minister meeting I think back in June. It has this QCCM mechanism, which brings together Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan um, with China. So I think China's increasingly sort of um, moving into the security sector. And it remains to be seen sort of how that will affect relations uh, with Russia. So I think certainly, you know, again, going forward, we can expect um, China's role um, in the economy to continue and its role in the security sector to probably increase. And I think, you know, for in some ways for Tajikistan, that's in their interest because they can sort of um, play, play off multiple sort of security partners off against each other um, to sort of generate their own benefits. But yeah, I think we can certainly expect that to continue going forward. Great, thank you. And and I have a last round of question, and I guess mostly for uh, Siroji Din and and Ellen about first the the fights among the family members, seeing there are tensions among among the uh, Rahman children. So if you could comment on that, and then what I think is a very important question is that the census, which is scheduled to be this month, include a question on religious affiliation. Uh, for the first time since independence. And so what does that mean in the government approach to religion during a Rahman new terms? And I think uh, that would be just given a few minutes to conclude on these uh, uh, two questions. Sirojidin, would you like to begin with the first about the, the kind of the state of the, the tensions inside the family? Uh, yes, uh, Rahman, as I told you earlier, has nine children, okay? Um, seven daughters and two sons. Rahman is the only among the former Soviet presidents uh, who has that enlarged family. Uh, this indicator could not but affect the political scene in Tajikistan. Many members of this family have been empowered to go on various spheres in, in countries' economy, starting from economy, uh, ending up the finance sector and uh, um, uh, military and um, uh, security service as well. For example, uh, Rustam Imam Ali is de facto, is the second, uh, by law, is the second most powerful uh, person, uh, uh, statesman in, in the country. He is the head of that upper uh, the chamber of parliament, Senate. Uh, if something happens to Rahman, if he, uh, he becomes gravely ill or if he dies, then Rustam, by law, becomes uh, president of the country. Uh, he is only 32 years old. Um, and then uh, we come to the second person uh, in the family, Ozod Rahman, uh, who is the head of the, the presiden uh, presidential staff. That's uh, the, the person, uh, only uh, everybody who wants to connect, uh, to contact with Rahman has to go through also the Rahman's uh, permission, which means that uh, she is the, the closest uh, person to the president himself. So even we hear reports that even um, the most powerful ministers, if they want to talk to a president, they must contact uh, also the Rahman first. And um, uh, as you know, uh, she has previously served as a deputy the foreign ministry, uh, foreign minister, and also the Rahman's uh, 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 husband, Jamaluddin Nuraliyev, uh, is the person, echo, uh, according to many uh, of experts or those who are involved in the financial sector, is the most uh, is the person who circulates the foreign currency. He controls the money. He was uh, a key figure in Agro Invest Bank. Now he is the, the first deputy of uh, Tajik National Bank, which means that uh, all uh, uh, flow of money is coming to Tajikistan and going out of Tajikistan is controlled by Jamaluddin Nuraliyev. Uh, he has, as, as I said, Rahman has uh, many uh, family members uh, and um, we can talk about all the daughters who are also very powerful. So we we uh, must bear in mind that uh, this power struggle 
exist, and we should not deny that. Uh, we sometimes hear that uh, uh, quarrels take place uh, in the Shambhe, in parties, uh, in the nightclubs, or in the restaurants. So you... We don't have uh, strong proof, but persistent rumors that uh, yes, there is a rivalry here. between. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 The last minute. Uh, yeah, um, I'll be quick. Yeah, the census is an interesting question. Uh, I think people were um, very suspicious as to why this question uh, came up, the question about religious affiliation. Um, and some people would argue that uh, it's because the uh, the government actually wants to know um, how many uh, there. Because I think if to my as far as I could see, uh, the questions were fairly general. They were not asking specific uh, the specific branches of Islam, for in, for instance, of Christianity you belong to. Um, and uh, some people were afraid that they would target. Uh, newly converted Christians. Um, so uh, that's that's um, uh, some um, uh, uh, Christians' uh, rights uh, NGO was uh, was mentioning. Um, but uh, but at the same time, people are because religion is such a sensitive topic. People are a bit afraid of answering that question, so they might actually skip it or not uh, or answer uh, undetermined or atheist uh, agnostic. Um, so yeah, but that's that's something new. That's something interesting, perhaps to measure, yeah, the the level of changes in in the Christian population, or maybe the exodus of Christian populations as well. Maybe last uh, word to add either on the Islam question, maybe on the more political side of it, or on the the on the the, the migrants in Russia and their political organization. We just have like two minutes left. Sure. No, I think um, I think in parliamentary elections. There are only four polling stations in Russia, so the parliamentary elections in March, and that's for a migrant population somewhere totaling around one million. Um, you know, most of whom, or all of whom, almost all of whom, are part of the electorate. Um, and so, you know, that's a massive disenfranchised population. Um, that's a population that I know a number of exiled opposition groups and movements have tried to target um, as sort of a potential sort of force for change within the country. Um, so certainly there are groups that have uh, been involved um, trying to uh, sort of uh, agitate, for want of a better word, amongst the, amongst the uh, migrant population. Um, but I think effectively those who are uh, left in, in Russia at this time, um, you know, I don't think many of them will be able to vote in this current election um, because you know they, they don't have the, the, the access to uh, to polling stations effectively. Great. Well, thank you so much for your analysis of this forthcoming selection and of the general situation in Tajikistan. I think we learn a lot and there was still other many other questions that I didn't have time to ask so I apologize for the people who asked them. Thank you once again, all of you. And for our audience, I remind you that tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we have another event on Kyrgyzstan, so a very timely one done in partnership with Carnegie, Oxford Society, and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So please join us for that discussion on what is happening in Kyrgyzstan also. And once again, thank you, everybody, and, and uh, hope to see you very soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.